Hey, Dr. Jay Joshi is a nationally recognized board certified anesthesiologist and fellowship trained interventional spine and pain management physician who has distinguished himself via his solid reputation, education, experience, and leadership roles in national acti activities, including advisory boards, educational and CME programs, publications, speaking events, and consulting. He is considered a national key opinion leader in pain management, and he has presented to a variety of audiences, both large and small, over 600 times. This would be 601. Internationally, he has worked at the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland, and has been featured on TV, radio, print, and the internet. Okay, that was his official bio. To those of us who are actually his patients, this is how we know him. It's just a little bit different than that. He's kind of cocky, but in a good way, because he knows what he's talking about. But he probably calls that confidence, okay? So I've heard him get pretty mouthy on the phone with insurance companies, so I call that awesome. And he's funny, but not quite as funny as he thinks he is. Okay. And he has no concept of time. But he is 100% worth the wait. And he just kept us waiting, so <laughs> he, just, he just proved my point, although this time it was because we were running early. <laughs> so it's usually the other way around. He's usually running late. But it, you know, he's always worth waiting for because we know that when we're sitting in his waiting room because he's running late, we're going to get, you know, I'm going to get that time next. When it's my turn to be in there, he's going to spend as much time as needed with me. So he's always worth the wait. So that's how we really know him. It, not exactly the same as a bio, and he's over there giving me that, see that smart aleck look? That's that cockiness, okay. So please welcome Dr. J. Joshi. I, I think, I think thank you, I'm not sure. I think that was a good intro, but I'm not quite sure. I'll have to look at the video afterwards and find out. Um, that was actually a good intro, but no, actually, so I don't run late. Everyone just runs early. Because <laughs> somewhere, like I'm running by on Rocky Mountain time, so, so I'm actually on time. But thank you for, uh, for, for coming and for attending. Uh, I think I'm the last present, uh, presenter of the day, right? And then the speaker panel. And then the speaker panel. So thanks for uh, sticking around, and, and hopefully I won't put you to sleep with this presentation. Uh, this presentation is a little different. If you guys were here last year, uh, you know, we talked about, uh, talked about sort of the, the typical chronic pain discussion where we really went over some science. We talked about central sensitization and we talked about how the brain plays a role. And, and I thought this year we'd try to do something a little different, something that perhaps uh, um, you might not have been exposed to before, but a topic that is really up and coming and a topic that uh, already many people have asked me about. Uh, just on the other side where our table is located. And that topic is regenerative medicine. So regenerative medicine and stem cells really uh, discusses a field of medicine that talks about how can we reverse disease, kind of like ketamine infusions in a way, instead of reversing central pain conditions, we're trying to reverse peripheral pain conditions and peripheral degenerative conditions. So I, I have nothing to disclose with this lecture. Uh, nobody has paid me to do this lecture. And an outline of what we're going to be talking about today. So first and foremost, looking at an overview of inflammation. What is inflammation and how does it happen? What is regenerative medicine? What is this field of, of regeneration that we're talking about? Take a brief look at the history of stem cells, where we were and where we are now. Look at the types of stem cells that we have. There are many types of stem cells that can be harvested from many different locations. We're going to look at autologous stem cells, or stem cells that come from your own body, and then we're also going to look at non-autologous stem cells, so stem cells that come from someone else's body or from some other place. And finally, look at non-stem cell regenerative products, so products that are not stem cells uh, but may still help with the regenerative process. So first, uh, let's look at inflammation. All right. So if you don't mind, I'm going to hold the microphone because I just think it's easier to move around. 
So inflammation, as we all know, is this process where things get inflamed. You know, we typically understand inflammation as joint inflammation, right? We've all had some joints swollen, our hands, our back, our neck. And that process is a complex process. It could be mediated by a bunch of different compounds, which we won't get into those details. But what we will talk about is that there's a physical and a chemical process that occurs during inflammation. And obviously, then our brains perceive that as painful. Inflammation is not a bad thing. It can be used as a protective mechanism. And, and the body reacting to that inflammation is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's your body trying to protect itself from further injury. So that's why you can see in this picture, you know, you have this man holding his arm. And what's really happening is you can see from these arrows that are moving back and forth, you know, there was an injury. It's telling the brain, hey, something bad is going on. And the brain is processing it. And it's telling the arm, well, try to stop that process. So here's the problem, though, sometimes that occurs when we have pain. OK, so we have this protective mechanism, but that protective mechanism can backfire on us because that protective mechanism then might delay our healing if things get too inflamed and they don't get better in a short period of time. It can decrease our appetite. It can decrease our function, which then leads to a whole list of, of uh, events. It can disrupt our sleep, our concentration. It can disrupt our, um, our cortisol levels, increase our, tr our stress. All of these things lead to that domino effect. You know, maybe you can't work as well then. Maybe uh, you can't enjoy life as much. So when we see that pathologic process of chronic inflammation, we try to figure out how can we stop those things. Now, we won't get into a discussion today about you know, all the pain management options that are available to reduce inflammation, reduce pain. But we will just sort of talk about this non-resolution of, of inflammation that occurs. Different conditions that have non-resolution of inflammation include things like cancer, obesity, multiple sclerosis, asthma. But you also have things like irritable bowel syndrome. You have COPD, atherosclerosis. So that's you know when you have those plaques in the heart. Um, failure to uh, have the appropriate switch in macrophage and T cells, which are these cells that try to fight infections. Uh, there obviously is a is a brain involvement in inflammation. Uh, there are various mediators, various you know, cells that are involved. So you can see it's not just one process. It's a complex process. This slide right here is, it can look complex on the surface and, and, and won't get into it in too much detail in an effort to try to make sure that everyone stays awake. But I do want to make sure that you guys all understand one point, which is inflammation and the immune system, Okay, the immune system and the central nervous system are, are closely tied together. So that's why when, um, you know, sometimes we'll have, we'll have situations where, you know, you have, uh, say, fibromyalgia, for example, where peripherally things get inflamed and centrally uh, the process is occurring. They're actually tied together with each other. And sometimes our treatments should look at both the immune system as well as the central nervous system. This slide right here is really talking about, uh, you know, how we evolved, how our nervous system evolved and our, our, our in the and the immune system evolved over the course of time. Way back in the old days, where we were single cell organisms and then multi cell organisms and then simple organisms, you know, we had more of regenerative pro uh, properties. We didn't have a very complex central nervous system. As we evolved as as animals, we had more complex animals that weren't able to regenerate but the nervous system became more complex. So long story short, as we started becoming human beings, we started become, becoming more complex organisms from a central nervous system standpoint, and we stopped being able to regenerate. And here we are today. So what is regenerative medicine? Again, it's a field that really deals with uh, regenerating or replacing or repairing normal tissue and normal function. It includes a whole variety of different possibilities, as simple as you know, microscopic changes, but also macroscopic changes. In fact, already, you know, we can grow organs in laboratories with stem cells. Um, now, we're not really that obviously hasn't been deployed into the general medical world, and there's some, you know, political and ethical questions surrounding that, even if it's coming from the patient's own body. Uh, we won't get into those, that political debate today, uh, but, but we have the technology to be able to do this already. And regenerative medicine involves stem cells as well as growth factors. So it's not just all about stem cells. 
So when we look at the healing environment, you know, we talked about inflammation, we talked about how it's important to make sure that inflammation resolves so you can get better. How do we do that? Well, our traditional techniques include anti-inflammatories, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, or even steroid medication, you know, oral as well as injectable to try to reduce inflammation. It can include things like hyaluronic acid. You may have heard of, you know, various products uh, under that category. For example, when, when knees are painful, they put, you know, various hyaluronic acid or some people call it rooster comb products into the knees to help the joints um, have a little more cushion with this sort of jelly-like substance. PRP, or platelet-rich plasma, which has been around for about 20 years or so, uh, looking at growth factors that's already existing in your own blood. Uh, amniotic fluid liquid suspension, which we'll talk about more, and amniotic fluid uh, uh, in general, as well as amniotic membrane and umbilical cord, we'll talk about in, in uh, more detail. And then finally, Wharton jelly liquid suspension, which contains some uh, non-autologous stem cells. So we'll talk about that as well. When we look at cellular products, or products that we can, we can harvest that have specific cells. One of the products is a lipoaspirate, which is uh, uh, when, when you literally do a liposuction uh, on a patient. And you harvest the cells, you spin them down, you take out all the fat, you take out all the other byproducts, and you have just uh, pure stem cells. And those are autologous stem cells. That means those are stem cells coming from your own body. Bone marrow aspirate concentration, where you you suck out the bone marrow, again, uh, spinning that down uh, to pure stem cells. Again, stem cells that are coming from your own body. And then umbilical cord blood. So the blood from the umbilical cord contains stem cells that can be spun down into um, more pure stem cells, although we'll talk about that in detail. And then finally, umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cells. So PRP is something that's been around for a little while. Have you guys all heard of PRP or who has or has not? Who has heard of PRP? And who has not heard of PRP? Okay, so probably about a two-third, one-third mix. Um, so PRP was sort of the kind of the original, you know, regenerative medicine um, techniques or options that we had. It's platelet-rich plasma, which is defined as autologous blood with concentrations of platelets above baseline, and that contains at least seven growth factors. Okay, so the way that that PRP is harvested and the way that is, uh, you know, administered is relatively simple, so what happens is you draw blood from the patient, that blood is then spun down into different components. As you can, as you can see right here on the bottom here, you know, it's kind of spun down, so you, you take the red blood cells out, you have the platelets and the white blood cells, and then you have the plasma. So when you spin that down, you're going to end up with um, um, you know, various growth factors, uh, and that's really what you're trying to to achieve in this process. It's been used since 1987, so it's been used for quite a while, uh, about 30 years now. And so it's kind of the, the old technology, if you will. It still works, um, but there are better options out there. There are other options out there. So some of the advantages are that it's coming from your own body, okay, so it's not coming from somewhere else. It's relatively cheap. Uh, it's not too expensive to, you know, if you, if you have all the equipment and everything, it's not too expensive to be able to, um, you know, get PRP. And, and usually it's not too expensive for, for the patient. Obviously everything's relative, as you know, in the medical world, unfortunately everything ends up being expensive just because the, the overhead that's involved. And it can be reproducible geographically. So, you know, anyone anywhere can draw blood. And if you have the right centrifuge and you have the right equipment to spin down the blood, I mean, that can really be done uh, almost anywhere. But some of the disadvantages, and, and you know, now that we have better technologies, we can really start you know, harping on the disadvantages because, because some of the newer technologies don't have these disadvantages. Um, you do see some inflammation with PRP, which some would argue is what you're looking for. You're trying to get an inflammatory response so you can have the body sort of repair itself. Uh, but that inflammatory response in some patients can be really uh, unpleasant, and it may actually just sort of, you know, almost prevent what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, you can have unwanted products in the cells. So things like white blood cells and other inflammatory agents can be in the PRP. And uh, that's a problem, you know. Uh, we're trying to reduce inflammation and reduce pain, and we're, we're not trying to create more problems. So that can happen. PRP is also drawn from the patient's blood if there's any infections in there, viruses, bacteria, whatever. This is not sterilized. So you may be reintroducing those, um, you know, those, those 
bad cells into the patient again. And then finally, there's still a lot of questions that exist in the sense of, okay, what's the right amount of PRP? You know, how, uh, you know, how many cells do we really need? What's more effective? What's less effective? So a lot of questions still haven't been answered uh, when it comes to, to PRP. So, but that's been, you know, PRP again, been around for about 30 years. For about 20 of those years, that was really the go-to agent when we're looking at regenerative medicine. Now we have a whole list of other options, and some of those options include stem cells. So here's a brief history on stem cells. The first, you know, adult stem cell research started about 40 years ago. And we started seeing, um, you know, even stem cell discoveries before that, but just with research on adult stem cells about 40 years ago. So back in the 1960s, you know, they had two separate types of bone marrow uh, populations of stem cells. They ha had hematopoietic stem cells and then bone marrow stromal cells. And, um, you know, the research started with those, and that was kind of the lineage that it was going down. Uh, they also discovered that rat brain contains two different types of uh, dividing cells, and uh, some of those cells could become nerve cells. So there were some really great discoveries. You know, then you fast forward a couple decades and you look at the 1990s, and uh, we found that we were able to differentiate into three separate types of cells, uh, neuronal cells, astrocytes, and um, oligodendrical cells. So then we had the late 90s, and that's when um, some of this, this political stuff started coming in. Uh, in the late 90s, in 1998, we saw that researchers first were able to extract stem cells for, from human embryos, which was an achievement of, of itself. Um, and they were able to then make insulin uh, growing cells. And that was wonderful. Uh, but there was obviously this big ethical dilemma, as you guys all probably remember. And uh, the debate was, boy, are you crushing embryos? Are you killing babies while doing this? Um, you know, maybe, maybe not. Who knows? We're not going to talk about that. But one thing that, that definitely happened is that the government came down and says, hey, listen, you're, we're stopping all stem cell research. There's, there's going to be no more stem cell research. And that held true for almost a decade. So you saw California kind of, you know, trying to buck that trend, but still, you know, in terms of funding and, and what they were actually able to do, it was very limited. So you, you saw for about 10 years the rest of the world uh, was continuing on with stem cell research, and there was really nothing going on in America at the time. Fortunately, the rest of the world was working on things, and, and we had some progress uh, during those years. And then, you know, finally, obviously, uh, about 10 years later, uh, we were able to resume stem cell research in America. And that stem cell research that we were resuming was not embryonic stem cell research. So when we're talking about stem cells nowadays, we're not remotely talking about embryos. We're not remotely talking about, you know, so-called crushing babies and those kind of um, ethical dilemmas that existed before. You know, we, we've discovered we can get stem cells from human skin. We've discovered that we can get stem cell, obviously, from from uh, fat, from bone marrow, but even, even teeth, you know. We can get stem cells from a lot of different places now, so we don't ever have to talk about uh, really any major ethical debates of how we're harvesting. Um, just in the last uh, four, four years or so, just for, uh, in our practice, we've been able to have multiple first uh, accomplishments with stem cells in terms of deployments. We have a couple more coming up uh, later this month uh, involving, you know, some of the, the developments that we're going to be talking about today. So types of stem cells, there's three basic types of stem cells. There's totipotent stem cells, pluripotent stem cells, and multipotent stem cells. I'm not asking you guys to memorize all this stuff, but I want to make sure that you understand that, that there isn't just one type of stem cell, and it doesn't just come from one location. Why is that important? It's important because as consumers, um, you know, you, just like anything else, buyer beware, you need to really know that you know, if you just have someone opening up and they say, hey, we're a stem cell clinic, Ask them some of these questions because you'll find that, that some of these places actually don't even use stem cells. So they're just saying that as a marketing tool. Um, but it's important to ask them, what, what exactly are you guys doing? So totipotent uh, stem cells are, are the cells from early life. Okay? They, they're as early as one to three days. The pluripotent stem cells happen um, you know, in the first few weeks. And then the multipotent stem cells are what uh, you and I
It was a counterfeit battery. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you haven't heard my counterfeit lectures, you really should. Uh, I talk about counterfeit stuff a lot. Um, so multipotent stem cells are the cells that we all have. They're the cells that you have as you, uh, when you become an adult. Uh, they're also in the cord blood, and they're also in the fetal tissue. So looking at this again from more of a, a, a visual, a graphical standpoint, because, you know, sometimes it's easier to sort of visualize stem cells when you can look at a picture. Totempotent stem cells, again, up in the front, um, right at the top there. So you have the fertilized egg. It kind of divides. Uh, you have the pluripotent stem cells, and after that, uh, and that's where you, 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 you know, form the embryo. And they have the multipotent stem cells. And that's what really forms all of the mature tissues, the bones, the nerves, you know, all of those things. So when we're looking at stem cells, we're looking at the multipotent stem cells. Uh, again, we're not using embryos. We're not looking at pluripotent or totipotent stem cells. So what are some of these potential uses? We, talk, we talked about that in the very beginning. But, I mean, you can do anything from research and learning about different diseases, learning about different genetic um, uh, origins of diseases and trying to overcome those diseases through uh, genetic therapy. We're looking at biotechnology as well. So that whole industry and, and again, how can stem cells provide, um, you know, biopharmaceutical products that could potentially cure diseases. And then cell-based therapies, things that we're already doing right now. Regenerative medicine, stem cells and, uh, you know, for, um, for degenerative conditions that we're already treating now, a whole variety of them. Uh, then you start getting into these sort of debatable things like cloning, you know, whether it's not just another person, but, you know, even in, in, in an individual's body. So, for example, if we need to clone an organ, like a liver, or we need to clone like a, you know, they've already done this, where they've been able to make people's ears, you know, ears got, uh, they, they, they were damaged in an accident, and they were able to glow, grow an ear and reattach an ear. So, you know, are those possible? Those are possible now. I think the, the biggest questions are just how far do you go with that? And then stem cells and cancer. There's already a lot of uh, uh, research being done on this. Multiple companies in the, uh, in the you know, biotech space working on um, stem cells as a way to fight cancer. And in fact, even our center has an IRB, which is a, a research, uh, approved research, uh, looking at uh, stem cells that are tagged with a virus that will specifically seek out uh, cancer cells and kill them. Kind of cool, right? Uh, I, I, quite frankly, I, I think that's actually going to be the future of, of, of cancer therapy. You know, forget all the high toxic drugs, but just engineer cells that only kill cancer cells. And, and that research is already being done. Uh, so, so hopefully that's not too far off. When we look at uh, homologous cells, okay, that, uh, and, and tissue products, we're going to call them HCT slash P. So when we look at those products, uh, which, which really uh, deal with, again, the growth factor products as well as some of these um, various stem cell products, we have to keep in mind that that whole industry is still not FDA approved. And there are a few different things that the FDA, that the government has said, that we have to say when we're talking about this uh, therapy, when we talk about regenerative medicine or stem cell therapy. So there were two different sections that came out. There was section 361 and section five, uh, 351, okay, as part of the statute uh, that the FDA created. And, and they, those statutes differentiate between minimally manipulated stem cell, or s tissues and cells of any kind, minimally manipulated tissues and cells that are intended for homologous use, and then uh, also, Section uh, 351 says biologic products derived from other living material, whether it's human or microorganism, uh, that's for some type of treatment or uh, prevention of some type of disease. Now, Section 361 is where, you know, if we're any, any clinic or any physician or any company that's putting out um, stem cells is, is really abiding to Section 361. We're not yet allowed to do Section 351, which is where we're taking products from, you know, other microorganisms, other animals, and then growing them out, manipulating them, and then claiming that they're supposed to cure a disease. Okay, we're not, we're not there yet. So um, uh, what you're seeing right now is places that do those things are taking it offshore. So they're going to, like, the Cayman Islands or they're going to 
you know, other places out of, out of the United States to be able to provide those therapies. Uh, and it's not to imply that those therapies are good or bad or better or worse. Uh, it's just how the law, the letter of the law currently. So some of the autologous stem cells, again, autologous again refers to stem cells that are from your own body. Uh, some of the pros and cons are, are here on the slide. So one of the pros is it's, it's a well-known source of stem cells. So, so every single person here has millions or maybe billions of stem cells, you know, floating around throughout your body. That's kind of nice. So, you know, why not harvest those if we need to? Uh, there's reduced risk of rejection, reduced risk of, of inflammation. Again, these are cells that are already in your body. We're just taking them from one place where they're kind of sequestered and putting them into a different place that actually needs them. Then finally, you know, th there's reduced potential for transmission of bacteria or virus because you either probably already have that bacteria or virus. It's probably not some third-party bacteria or virus that's going to be introduced because, again, it's coming from your own body. Just to give you a, a frame of reference, you know, when we're reintroducing your own stem cells, it's happening literally, you know, an hour after you harvest it. So it's happening right away. So it's not, you know, sort of being, you know, locked up for weeks or months somewhere. It's, it's, it's being taken out and put right back in. So some of the cons, it is a surgical procedure. We'll, we'll go into a little detail about how the harvesting is done, but, but ultimately you have to harvest in some way. There's additional capital that's required. There's more disposable equipment. There's surgical equipment. And these are all one-time use things. These are all low volume, one-time use um, items. So, so the cost can be a little higher. Uh, there can be some complications, obviously, with any procedure, including any surgical procedure. And sometimes you may have concentrations that may be lower than what you want. This is especially true with the bone marrow aspirations. The bone marrow aspirations are up to 100 times lower in terms of concentrations than the fat aspirations. So the liposuction-derived um, stem cells are, are about 100-fold, or even more sometimes, uh, concentrated with stem cells than the bone marrow aspiration. Um, it's, it's, for, it's for that reason as well as the fact that most people are more than happy to give up their fat, but they're not so happy to give up their bone marrow. Um, especially when you find out how it's actually done. You literally have to take a huge trocar, a huge boring needle, and smash through the iliac crest, put a hole in the bone, and suck out that bone marrow, potentially lead to fractures in the future and all these other problems just to get that bone marrow. Or I can just suck out your fat. You know, which one would you want, right? Um, so obviously we've done the lipo aspiration for many years, and uh, really, um, uh, you know, bone marrow aspiration is great. It's been around for longer than lipoaspiration, but at this point, bone marrow aspiration is, in my mind, completely pointless when we have lipoaspiration uh, and when we have some other technologies that we'll talk about. So this is adipose-derived uh, adult stem cells. This is an actual picture from one of our patients, okay, one of our procedures. Uh, so you can see here that we're, we're sort of doing the, the lipoaspiration. It's literally a liposuction. You're just going, uh, you know, beneath the skin at uh, some of the layers of fat that li live beneath the skin, and uh, you're sucking it out just like you would with, um, with a liposuction. Uh, and, um, and then, you, you know, you spin it down. You do multiple washes where you're washing out all the fat. You're washing out all the white blood cells. You're trying to wash out all the red blood cells. And so you're just left with, uh, with pure stem cells. Bone marrow aspiration, on the other hand, um, you know, you can kind of see a little picture here. Uh, you have this guy sort of shoving this needle uh, into a bone, um, you know, putting a hole in the bone, sucking it out, uh, and then spinning it down, and then, again, getting uh, stem cells from that. Uh, it's been used, you know, bone marrow aspiration, again, has been used for a long time, and orthopedics has, have used it for a very long time during their surgeries. So, so literally right during their surgeries, you know, they'll, they'll aspirate some of that bone marrow out, and... Uh, and um, you know, spin it down right there in a centrifuge, and then just reinject that right where they're doing surgery. And it helps with some of their outcomes, uh, but uh, but but again, not as uh, not as concentrated as the um, as the lipo aspirate. So now, when we look at non-autologous stem cells, so these are stem cells that don't come from your body. You know, in the past, this was a problem. Now we have newer technologies where we can actually get stem cells that, that don't come from your body, and they're immunoprivileged, which means that you don't get an immunologic response, or at least in theory. There's a few different companies out there and a few different technologies out there. And I'll sort of give you, I won't tell you about names of different companies, but I'll just give you um, 
the pluses and minuses. So again, you do your own research, right? So non-autologous pros and cons. Um, the pros are you can get high concentration, sometimes millions of cells per cc. Uh, you can get epigenetically young cells, which means that these are cells that are literally a few months old versus many decades old, which is the case in, in, in many patients, right? 30, 40, 50, 70, 80 years old, you know, versus a few months old. So those cells, almost 100% of them should be active, or, or, or a very high percentage should be active, whereas when we turn 70, 80 years old, the thought is that maybe less than 10% of those cells are actually active, you know? And, and so you see a big drop off. So you may have a million cells, but only 100,000 might be active, whereas here you may have a million cells and maybe 950,000 are active. Um, it's quick, it's easy, it's reproducible. You have, obviously, you can get them from multiple different sources. Uh, there's no surgery involved, so the, the costs sometimes are lower, and there's no known complications as of now. Cons, potential bacteria, potential viruses, uh, logistical issues, you know, handling. These products have to be stored at negative 200 degrees Celsius, not Fahrenheit. So uh, this is uh, pretty, pretty darn cold, so it's not something you want to stick your hand into because uh, it will be gone within a second. Um, so they have to be stored very cold. There's, there's a little cost involved in that. There's some logistical uh, and training issues um, uh, with those non-autologous stem cells. So some non-autologous products, umbilical cord-derived stem cells uh, are, are, are available. Umbilical cord tissue matrices are available. So those are matrices of different growth factors. There's amniotic liquid suspension that have, uh, again, different proteins and growth factors. And then there's amniotic membrane. And the amniotic membrane itself is used for a lot of burns, um, wound management. So, so these, this is actual thin membrane that actually sits on top of, you know, some type of injury or wound. And um, I'm not going to get, I, this is the last I'm going to talk about the membrane because we don't use that uh, in, in, you know, for our purposes in typical pain management. Uh, but uh, the results can be quite dramatic, you know, um, uh, with amniotic membrane. So the three things that we would probably end up using are umbilical cord derived stem cells, umbilical cord, and amniotic membrane matrices. And uh, uh, we, we, we personally don't use uh, amniotic liquid. There's, there's a lot of disadvantages to that, uh, but some places do. Just know that when we look at amniotic liquid suspension, as well as these umbilical cord and amniotic membrane tissue matrices, there are no stem cells in them, okay? And I'll repeat that because this is a huge point. You're going to see you mark my words, over the next few years, you're going to see stem cell clinics popping up left and right. Okay, everyone and their brother is going to do it, and they already are starting to do that. And there's a few of them that advertise quite heavily. And a lot of them are using these things that contain zero stem cells, but they advertise that those are stem cells. To me, that's fraud. You can call it whatever you want to. Uh, and even if there were stem cells, it undergoes something called terminal sterilization. Okay, when you, when you get these products, um, uh, from, from donated sites, they have to sterilize them. So even if there were cells, they're killing those cells off during the sterilization. So now, it may still help you, because these cytokines, growth factors, proteins may help you, just like PRP may help you. But, you know, then why don't you just do PRP and save yourself thousands of dollars, right? So that's where the, the dishonesty comes in. So that's one, one thing I want to make sure you guys are aware of. Wharton's jelly is a mucous connective tissue within the umbilical cord, okay? And that jelly contains stem cells. So one of the non-autologous sources for stem cells is this Wharton's jelly. And uh, that, that, that area, okay, that area, that mucous connective tissue in the umbilical cord, is an immunoprivileged area, which means it doesn't belong to the mom and it doesn't really belong to the baby, which is why we're able to harvest stem cells from there and potentially deploy them into other individuals without getting that immunologic response. So some of the, you know, some of the advantages, obviously, one, uh, you know, again, there, there, there is no harvesting. This is coming from somewhere else, so there's no harvesting on the patient. You have about 130 million live births worldwide, so that's a huge amount of source of this Wharton's jelly and of these stem cells. Uh, rate of proliferation is higher than other sources. It's easily collected. There really are no ethical concerns because, again, this is nothing, this is all, you know, this all, really umbilical cord, placental tissue, you know, it's all pretty much thrown in the, in the garbage after a delivery. And, and, and now we have this excellent source of stem cells that we might be able to use. 
And they also have inherently non-tumorigenic properties. So one other question people have is, hey, will I get a tumor with these stem cells? That's not how stem cells work. Uh, we have no evidence right now that, that stem cells will cause tumors. Uh, it's, just, it's just not how, how, how it works. So some of the benefits of mesenchymal stem cells is their ability to, to penetrate or migrate to areas that have inflammation. You know, we started this conversation about inflammation, and we're sort of going to be ending it on that same note. They, you want them to go to these areas that are, that are damaged and they're not healing and allow them to heal. Now, how do you get them there? You can get them there through injection. You can get them through IV infusion. Uh, uh, even in, in some patients, inhalation. So we've had some patients with lung disorders where they've inhaled stem cells uh, and, and, and found it to be beneficial. So cryopreservation, I just want to show you a quick slide. This is a cryo freezer. And uh, these little sticks contain the stem cells at the bottom. You know, this is stored at negative 200 degrees Celsius. So if you guys ever have stem cells deployed and they're non-autologous stem cells, they're probably going to be stored in a freezer that looks a little like this. So umbilical cord blood, I'll quickly touch on that. It's, not, it's something that's used um, more in the cosmetic industry than it is used in the pain management industry where we're injecting joints or even uh, um, you know, neural tissue. So umbilical cord uh, has stem cells. Uh, some of the, one of the biggest problems with umbilical cord is it also has a lot of other things. And we're talking about the blood itself that's in the umbilical cord. You know, you have uh, a lot of other factors in there. And some of those factors can actually cause the, you know, reaction with, uh, you know, with, with the other patient. So that's one of the problems we've seen with umbilical cord blood. Now, some of these companies are able to filter most of the blood out, but they're not able to filter all of it out. So that blood still exists in the stem cell product. And um, so right now, we're not using that for uh, pain management purposes since we have umbilical cord product that has you know, either stem cell or uh, growth factors, and it, and it bypasses this, this blood issue. Uh, so that, this slide is kind of just talking about that, you know, a little comparison between the two. Um, we're not using blood product, we're using more of a tissue product uh, and getting cells directly from that. So we're able to avoid some of the, uh, the, the blood reactions. And that's why we can use those products and still be immunoprivileged. So we don't see the graft versus host disease. You know, we don't see this uh, acute or chronic problems with the graft versus, versus host disease uh, because we're not introducing the immunologic cells into the patient. Amniotic membrane, okay, this is kind of a picture of what that would look like. Uh, amniotic membrane is typically the, you know, um, um, used for, for different wounds or, or injuries. It, it's terminally sterilized. Again, it does not have any uh, stem cells inherent in that product. Uh, and that product is really used for, for burns and, and areas that are uh, surgical areas or whatever that aren't healing well. Amniotic membrane can also be used uh, um, not as a, a physical membrane, but as a a product that contains growth factors, and that is something that we can use, so we can inject that product. Amniotic fluid, like I said before, is not something that we're using uh, simply because it does not contain stem cells. It does have various growth factors, but we can get those growth factors uh, in a much uh, higher concentration and in a much better way through amniotic membrane or umbilical cord. Uh, but some, some stem cell clinics do use amniotic fluid um, I believe because it is the cheapest, you know, product that you can buy, and, um, uh, and some of them are advertising as stem cells, and, and it's not. So cell differentiation, I mean, how do we know that, that, you know, what we're getting? There are different instruments that we can use, different cell counters and different uh, flow cytometry monitors that we can use to, to assess what kind of product we have. We use those products even for lipoaspiration, so when we're doing, you know, when we're doing the the um, liposuction and getting your own stem cells, this is how we're able to test to see what kind of you know, stem cells and how much we're going to have. Um, how do we know if, if a product is, I don't know, not necessarily better, but something that's going to cause a reaction? We look at something called CD markers. These markers are on different cells, and they help identify those cells. So if we see markers with a lot of CD14, uh, CD34, CD45, that would tell us that we have a lot of white blood cells and red blood cells, and those are not the cells that we're looking for. 
we're looking for more of the mesenchymal stem cells, and those would have markers like CD73, CD90, and CD105. Why do I tell you this? Because you're probably thinking to yourself, that's a lot of numbers and letters. Because if you are planning on having some type of stem cell deployment that's looking at non-autologous stem cells or growth factors or products, ask them, where are you getting it from? And ask them, tell me, tell me you know, what kind of ratios of CD14, 34, 45 that you have, and tell me what your ratios of, of these are. And if they can't answer those questions, find someone else, because they don't know what they're doing. So research growth, there's been a lot of research that's happened in the last few years. As you can see, this starts at 2008 and uh, goes all the way to 2017, and we've seen almost a five-fold increase in the number of publications that are out there on uh, just umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cells. So the research is increasing, which is a good thing. Uh, we're still in our infancy, but we're, uh, um, you know, we've already been able to do some amazing things with regenerative medicine. So right now, there's about 137 clinical studies just on, on looking at umbilical cord stem cells, um, uh, and not even including the other autologous options that are out there. Any questions about anything? Ah, we'll do questions on the panel. All right, great. Well, then, thank you. Thank you for coming.